I, I ended up in a scenario where I was looking closely at some of the stories involving the immortal Hulk Hogan. And this was before he was the immortal Hulk Hogan. I think he took on being the immortal Hulk Hogan, I think, I want to say around WrestleMania 7. Around 1991, that phase of Hulk Hogan, I believe, was the immortal Hulk Hogan. I could be wrong, though. I haven't, I haven't been studying WrestleMania 7 era Hogan. But what I have found in looking at Hulk Hogan's initial WWE run, which was, you know, 19, basically 1984 to 1993, right? WrestleMania is one through nine, give or take with a little spare change on the front end of WrestleMania 1 and a little spare change on the back end of WrestleMania 9. But I was looking at Hulkamania, one of the first real powerhouse forces of pushing pro wrestling beyond pro wrestling and into the mainstream. Hulkamania was something that as big as other stuff has been, as big as Dusty Rhodes was, as big as Ric Flair was, as big as Bruno San Martino was, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, as big as all of them were. Hulk Hogan was the guy who entered into that that world of, of 1980s pop culture beyond wrestling. Hulk Hogan is the one that entered into that world of, for kids, He-Man, Thundercats, Hulk Hogan. He was the he had a Saturday morning cartoon series. He was on cereal boxes. He had cookies in the supermarket. I mean, he he was the guy. It was like you had your He-Man toy, you had your Thundercats toy, you had your Raphael from the Ninja Turtles, you had your Hulk Hogan LJN. And if you had any every single person I knew growing up in that era, if they had any action figures whatsoever, they had a Hulk Hogan LJN and they had an Iron Sheik LJN. And the reason they had the Iron Sheik is because he was one of those first sort of quintessential villains. But that was before WrestleMania, right? Iron Sheik was the first foreign menace, not in wrestling, not by a long shot. There were, I mean, foreign menaces uh, up the wazoo before the Iron Sheik. But the Iron Sheik was the first foreign menace that Hulk Hogan, had to take out on on a world championship level. And that led to him being, I mean, he was the first person that Hulk Hogan had to conquer to win the WWE championship. It ended up being the first iconic victory for Hulk Hogan. And then, and, and Hulk Hogan had a lot of iconic foes, right? You go to WrestleMania one and it's, it's Paul Orndorff had turned on him. So obviously there was animosity between Hogan and Orndorff, but R Rowdy Roddy Piper was really, it was, it was that, that hugely charismatic force of, of evil that was the perfect counterpart to Hulk Hogan's force of, of good and perseverance in the American way, training and saying your prayers and eating your vitamins. Once we got past that, WrestleMania two was where it became not about the foreign menace, but about the undefeatable monster. That's when it was King Kong Bundy inside of a blue steel cage. And it's, it's look at the size of this monster. How is Hulk Hogan? I mean, Hulk Hogan, he was bigger than Piper. He was bigger than Orndorff. He's even bigger than the Iron Sheik. That's the thing that Hogan's always had. He's six foot seven or so, I believe he was listed at six foot eight at some points in his career. King Kong Bundy though, King Kong Bundy was bigger than any human being you'd ever seen in your life, except for one, which we'll get to in a second. And Hogan was able to defeat King Kong Bundy. So you would think after he had gone through all these phases that you would risk Hulkamania starting to lose steam right? That you would, you, you've already had, it. he's already defeated the monster. He's defeated the person with an equal charisma to him. And he's defeated the foreign menace. Where are we going to go from here? And what I don't know that anybody realized is this is where you begin to hit peak Hulkamania. To me, if you look at Hulkamania and everything that it was, some would argue that peak Hulkamania is 1985 WrestleMania one, maybe, but to me, Peak Hulkamania in terms of storytelling is WrestleMania 3 through 5. It's post-WrestleMania 2 
up until WrestleMania 5. Because this, this is where your great story is told. And it's all one story, if you think about it. And realistically, it's one story of a guy that we were cheering that could never quite learn his lesson. It's Hulk Hogan repeating the same thing over and over again and then thinking, why are you so mad at me? Why me? So Hogan, and this is all, we're talking storyline here, right? I, this is the best part about uh, talking about this stuff. I'm coming to you as a fan. I wasn't behind the scenes for anything. I don't have any information that you don't already have. All I can do is watch the show and analyze the characters. That's what we're here to do on Not Sam Wrestling. So coming off of WrestleMania 2, we also saw uh, Andre the Giant uh, win the Battle Royal against the NFL stars, right? WrestleMania 1, Andre the Giant, who had always had a rivalry with Bobby the Brain Heenan's Heenan family. Body slam Big John Stud. $10,000 body slam challenge. He gave most of the money out to the audience before Bobby Heenan, dastardly as he was, stole it. But this is going back with the Heenan family, right? And he wins the battle royal and Andre disappears for a while. Andre goes away. And while he's gone, Heenan is claiming that Andre is afraid of the giants that Heenan has assembled. That Heenan says Andre is afraid to get in the ring with King Kong Bundy. At one point, uh, there's a challenge made from King Kong Bundy to Andre the Giant. Andre doesn't answer it, and Andre ends up with a suspension from WWE. The Giant Machine storyline commences, but that's not really what we're talking about, right? Because when we see Andre the Giant again, it's on the Piper's Pit. Hulk Hogan comes on to the Piper's Pit one day, and... Uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper awards Hulk Hogan a trophy for running with the WWE Championship for three years. Three years as champion, a good guy heroic champion, and Rowdy Roddy Piper is the one to present him with the trophy, ironic as it was, you know? And, and part of it is because Piper gets it. Piper's been on the other side of it. And at this point, he goes, you know what? If anybody deserves it. It's Hogan. That's the vibe that Piper's got, you know? Piper, there's always that seedy underside of Piper, but at this point, he knows he knows what Hogan's done to hold on to that title because Piper's the one that made him hold on to it. Andre the Giant comes out on Piper's pit to shake Hulk Hogan's hand. Now, for the three years that Hogan has been champion, Andre and Hogan have been friends. Andre was there when Hogan first won the WWE Championship from the Iron Sheik in Madison Square Garden. He was one of the people dumping champagne over the head of Mean Gene Okerlund and Hulk Hogan as Andre as Hogan celebrated his title win. See, the three years that Hogan had been champion, Andre had been an attraction. Andre was advertised as this guy who had been undefeated for 50, years. Nobody had ever beat Andre, but he was happy to congratulate Hulk Hogan. You're the man, Hogan. You're the top guy. I'm just going to keep beating everybody that's been put in front of me. And he shakes Hulk's, Hulk Hogan's hand and Hogan notices the firm grip that Andre had, but you know, Andre's a giant. Of course he's got a firm grip. And uh, Andre tells Hogan three years. That's a long time for somebody to be champion. And he kind of walks off, but I think Hogan in that blonde California way, uh, that 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 sort of uh, dopey naivete that Hogan puts on sometimes that I wonder, is he really that naive? Uh, you go, oh, I guess Andre's happy for me. Three years is a long time. That's why I got my trophy, brother. And he walks off. The next week on Piper's Pit, Andre the Giant is the guest. And he receives a trophy for being undefeated for 15 years. And you can't help but notice as an audience member that the trophy that Andre receives is significantly smaller than the trophy that Hogan received. Now, being the champion and being on top for three years is a big deal, but Andre is thinking 15 years undefeated and my trophy is that much smaller than Hogan's. And much like Andre had done for Hogan, one would think, Hogan 
walks out to congratulate Andre and he's there celebrating. He's celebrating with Andre. And Andre walks off. And there's this vibe as Hogan is celebrating with Andre that he notices Andre's getting that spotlight and Hogan's coming out to get some of that for himself. And maybe that's just the way Andre's seeing it. Maybe that's just the way I saw it. But when Hogan came out, it just felt like the Hulkster saw good things happening for one of his friends and thought, man, I like it when people cheer for me. I'd like to go out there and get some of that for myself. Because when Hogan goes out there and he never, he doesn't really take ownership of this. Hulk Hogan is Mr. Hulkamania. He's Mr. Champion. When he's on the scene, the spotlight kind of automatically goes to him. And he goes out there and that happens again. Andre walks off. And Hogan is shocked by this. He doesn't understand why Andre would just walk away from him. So he goes, let's hash this out. Third week now, we go to Piper's Pit and we're going to have Andre and Hogan talk this thing out. And Andre walks out and Bobby the Brain Heenan is by his side. This is unthinkable. Bobby the Brain Heenan is by the side of Andre the Giant. See, Bobby the Brain Heenan is the one that's pointed all this out to Andre the Giant that while Hulk Hogan has been champion for three years and has declared Andre the Giant as his best friend, at no point did he offer Andre the Giant the courtesy of a championship match. He enjoyed having Andre the Giant as a friend, the undefeated, undefeatable giant from the French Alps. Loved having him in his corner. Never, ever once did he say to Andre, you know, you should at least have the chance to be a champion. It was almost as if as, if as long as Hulk Hogan was champion, Hogan was far more comfortable having Andre as a friend than as a foe, that maybe on some level, Hogan knew that if Andre were to decide to be champion, that that title was his for the taking. And Andre didn't feel as though, Andre felt as though, yes, Hulk Hogan is the champion because I allow it to be so. But Hulk Hogan doesn't pay me that respect. Hulk Hogan doesn't walk around here like he's the champion, but it's only because I'm his friend. No, Hulk Hogan walks around like he's the inarguable top dog, especially after three years. Hulk Hogan walks, walks around like the spotlight is his to take at any moment. Hulk Hogan doesn't, doesn't walk around giving reverence to Andre the Giant. Hulk Hogan walks around like, hey, Andre, there you are. My second, my second, last I checked, seven foot five, 500 pounds, Andre the Giant don't play second to nobody. And that's exactly what Hogan found out when Andre grabbed him by the chest and said he was ready for his title match. He ripped the shirt and the cross off the neck of Hulk Hogan. And when he did so, he did it with such force that he lacerated the chest of Hulk Hogan. And Roddy Piper looked at Hogan and uttered those immortal words to him. You're bleeding. You're bleeding. Hogan couldn't believe what he was seeing, but he answered that challenge. Yes! He said he absolutely would face Andre the Giant in a match at WrestleMania. And so there we were. It was Time to have the match. They sit down. They have the contract signing. Hogan says, if you wanted a shot at the title, Andre, all you had to do was ask. Ask, motherfucker. Ask. I had to ask you for an opportunity at the championship? Let me ask. Did you ask the Iron Sheik for a championship match? Or were you awarded a championship match? Bro. We're boys. You know what I can do. You know that the reason that you never even thought to present the idea to me was because you knew you'd lose. Ask. I had to ask for a championship. Well, now Andre says 
he's ready to go to WrestleMania three and beat Hulk Hogan for the title. So they go to WrestleMania three and they have the most iconic match up until that point in the history of WWE. 90,000 people pack the Pontiac Silver Dome in Pontiac, Michigan to watch the irresistible force meet the immovable object. And what made this different from anything else is this had all the the all the 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 physical attributes and then a lot more of King Kong Bundy and Hulk Hogan. This had all the 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 uh, charismatic attributes of Roddy Piper and Hulk Hogan, and then more. This had all the hero versus villain dynamic of Iron Sheik and Hulk Hogan, and then more. It had it all. This was the ultimate match. Everything. And they go for it, and they tell their story. And that's the point, that leading into this, it had all that story. And they have their match, and Hulk Hogan is able to beat the Giant. But something special happened right there. And, you know, it's really funny because these days fans will point out how many times WWE has gone back to the well on Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns as if it's something new. That that with the SummerSlam match, there were three Brock and Roman matches within... I think within a calendar year, with almost within a calendar year of each other. But this is nothing new, okay? People act like this is the, this is not something WWE does. Let me tell you something. After WrestleMania three, all WWE was doing was Hogan versus Andre. Hogan versus Andre had three massive single matches inside of a single year, plus a Survivor Series match, plus everything that went on outside of pay-per-views and Saturday night's main event shows. The whole Hogan story revolved around Andre coming off of WrestleMania three, because after WrestleMania three, Hogan and Andre go to survivor series in November of that year. And they're captaining opposing teams on survivor series. Then we go to Saturday night's main event. And on Saturday night's main event, we start doing uh, matches between Hulk Hogan and King Kong Bundy, a member of Bobby Heenan's family, of course. But Andre the Giant is at ringside for all of them. King Kong Bundy is trying to win the match on behalf of Andre the Giant. It's at this point that a new superstar enters the WWE. His name is the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. This guy is everything that every working class, average Joe American could ever hate. Every person that's ever worked for a living can relate to the guy that is there to try to put them down and thinks that they're allowed to do it because of the amount of money that they have. And that is the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Ted DiBiase, he shows up and he says that he is in the WWE to become the WWE champion. And how is he going to get there? Well, he's going to, the same way he's gotten everything in his life, he's going to purchase it. And he goes to, to Hulk Hogan and he says, Hogan, I'd like to purchase the WWE championship from you. And Hulk Hogan turns him down. No, 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 no. Hulk Hogan doesn't come from that world. Hulk Hogan wants to tell the world that money can't, buy everything. And one of those things it can't buy is the WWE championship that has now been around the waist of Hulk Hogan for four years because nobody can take it off him yet because Ted DiBiase says, okay, Hogan, if you won't sell me the title, I'll do the next best thing. And he, through financial means, acquires the rights to Andre the Giant's ability to win the championship. Ted DiBiase buys his way in to the Andre the Giant Bobby Heenan operation and he purchases the right to be given the WWE championship should Andre the Giant beat Hulk Hogan. And this all comes to a head at the first ever episode of the main event. See, Saturday night's main event was on Saturday. But the main event, well, that was on on Friday. 
But at the main event, we got Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant in the WrestleMania 3 rematch on free network television, on NBC, drew one of the biggest television ratings that anything for pro wrestling has ever drawn. And it gave us one of the most memorable finishes of that era, or quite frankly, if you saw it, any era. See, what happened was Ted DiBiase's at ringside, Bobby Heenan's at ringside, it's Hogan versus Andre, and the referee in the ring is Dave Hepner. And a big deal is made out of that because uh, at WrestleMania 3, Joey Morello was the referee. And uh, Jesse Ventura said that he was a bad referee. Now, the reason that Jesse Ventura said Joey Morello was a bad referee might have been long-term storytelling, but was probably more likely a rib because Joey Morello was the real-life son of Gorilla Monsoon, who was commentating alongside Jesse Ventura at WrestleMania 3. So it was probably Jesse Ventura's way of making jokes about Gorilla Monsoon's son right in front of Gorilla Monsoon without Gorilla Monsoon being able to say, hey, that's my son, because he wasn't Joey Monsoon. He was Joey Morella. Regardless, Dave Hepner is the referee who is in play for the giant Andre the Giant versus Hulk Hogan rematch on the main event. What happens is Andre ends up on top of Hogan, Covers him, counts one. Hogan gets the shoulder way up. Referee is in position. He's not even out of position. Referee goes two and three. Referee counts to three. The fans can't believe it. Hogan can't believe it. All of a sudden, Andre the Giant is presented the WWE Championship. The bell rings. This is the first time, by the way, I believe, that the Winged Eagle Championship is on WWE television. This is the debut of the Winged Eagle Championship, I think, if I'm right. And Andre the Giant has won it. And what does he do? He gives it right over to Ted DiBiase. Ted DiBiase laughs. laughs. Sounds exactly like him. As Ted DiBiase is crowned WWE champion. Hulk Hogan is going, what the hell happened? What the hell happened? Dave Hepner's looking at him. All of a sudden, another referee slides into the ring and goes, no, 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 this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be. Hogan looks at him, it's Dave Hepner. Hogan looks at the other referee, that's Dave Hepner. Hogan goes, what the hell just happened? You see Hogan's face melting in front of our eyes. He tries to assault the referee that did him wrong. Not exactly the most good guy thing in the world to do. But the other referee says, that's not him, that's me, that's not me, that's him. There's two Dave Hepners in front of our faces for the first time on WWE TV. We find out, apparently what happened was, Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase has such great finances and such a lack of monetary limitation that he actually found a crooked official not only paid them to make sure that Andre the Giant won the WWE Championship, but paid for them to get plastic surgery to look exactly like Dave Hepner. And a lot of people said, that's just storyline. That's not real life. Dave and Earl Hepner are actually just twins. That same referee that the Million Dollar Man paid off and got plastic surgery to, eight years later, maybe eight or nine years later would screw Brett. I'm just saying there's something to it, okay? But that's not what we're talking about here because that match would lead to the WWE Championship being declared vacant. See, President Jack Tunney said that, look, Hogan did lose the title, so he's not the champion. And Andre the Giant did forfeit the title, so he's not the champion. But that title cannot be purchased. It's not for sale. There is nothing in our governing body that would allow the million dollar man Ted DiBiase to claim that he is the WWE champion. So the title's vacant. And at WrestleMania, we're going to do a 14 man tournament to crown a new champion. 14 man, not 16 man? No, because since Andre and Hogan were the last two champions, crooked official or not, Andre and Hogan will receive a bye and move into the second round automatically. Okay. 
as we're going, by the way, to WrestleMania, Macho Man Randy Savage has started to become more of a fan favorite, and he is starting to develop problems with the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase. In fact, on the main event before WrestleMania, the one I think days before WrestleMania maybe, uh, Macho Man ends up on, on a savage beating end, pun intended, from Andre the Giant and the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase, which has to be broken up by Hulk Hogan when he comes in to save Macho Man. See, leading up to WrestleMania, we start seeing on, on live events and we uh, uh, Macho Man and Hulk Hogan actually teaming up. We start seeing them on things like the main event on NBC. They're on the same side of action for the first time. So we get to WrestleMania 4 and WrestleMania 4 is billed as the grand rubber match. Andre the Giant versus Hulk Hogan one more time. See, how about that? Not only... Did the WWE uh, uh, advertise Andre and Hogan as face, uh, as competing at multiple WrestleManias? They did it twice in a row. There's never been another WrestleMania main event, I don't think, other than Roxena that happened twice in a row. And that was once in a lifetime. Brock Roman didn't do two WrestleManias in a row. So Andre and Hogan, because... Technically, they're not the main event because it's obviously the beginning of a tournament, but it's the, it's the advertised match on the show. There's no other main event level matches in the first round of the tournament. So the match happens. Andre versus Hogan. It's finally going down. But in the match, Hogan loses his cool. Hogan hits Andre with a chair. Andre hits Hogan with a chair. And even though technically, I believe Hogan did hit first, the referee calls it a double disqualification which is as unsatisfying as you could possibly have for a finish now they would go on and have more matches and and uh, uh, wrestlefest 88 which came out on uh, uh, coliseum home video they have a great cage match which hulk hogan wins officially he definitely wins the battle but uh, or the war i should say but regardless of that at wrestlemania 4 we move into the next phase of what I believe is all one story. This one, two and a half year long story, three year, you could argue, story chunk of Hulkamania. And it's the best story chunk in all of Hulkamania. So at WrestleMania 4, Hogan and Andre are wiped out. Ted DiBiase gets a buy in the tournament because he was going to have to face, the way the brackets lined up, the winner of Hogan versus Andre. So Ted DiBiase makes it all the way to the finals, as does the macho man Randy Savage. As I said, Hogan had developed this kinship with Randy Savage, but it was really because he had developed a friendship with the macho man's manager and his lady, Miss Elizabeth. Now, uh, they try to do some uh, interference in the Ted DiBiase-Randy Savage match Hogan doesn't let that happen. He jumps in the ring and he helps Randy Savage behind the referee's back and he allows Randy Savage to win the tournament and become the new WWE champion. Now, my problem here is that at WrestleMania 4, we are now a year and a half removed from the Piper's Pit episode where Hulk Hogan sits there and tries to steal the spotlight from Andre the Giant as Andre the Giant receives his undefeated for 15 years trophy. Which, by the way, in all the asshole moves of asshole moves, not only did he make it so that Andre could not properly enjoy his undefeated trophy, but if you're following the logic of this story, he then defeated Andre. He ruined the undefeated streak. He ruined... Andre's acceptance of the trophy by coming in and stealing the spotlight and then to add insult to injury defeated Andre and ruined the undefeated streak I mean unforgivable how would Andre ever forgive Hogan after that we get to Wrestlemania 4 and yes he does help Savage win the title but at the end of Wrestlemania 4 Savage is holding the title up the title, the WWE Championship, signifies the number one person in the company. When Hulk Hogan had it, he was number one. 
Roman Reigns has it right now. He's number one. When Brock Lesnar had it, he was number one. Whoever has it is the number one guy. And what? how do we go off the air for WrestleMania 4? Hulk Hogan gets his ass in the ring and starts posing like he accomplished something. Hulk Hogan gets in the ring and starts flexing and celebrating that Macho Man won the title. What did I just say about the spotlight that Hulk Hogan is responsible for being aware of? That when Hulk Hogan is in the ring, tearing off his shirt, flexing his muscles and posing, that the spotlight is naturally going to go to him. He learned nothing, nothing, not a thing from the entire Andre the Giant saga, a year and a half. And nothing penetrates the thick skull of Hulk Hogan because he does the exact same thing to his new friend, Macho Man. This is like the guy that you know that everybody has a problem with. And he doesn't understand why all those people have such a problem. All, if everyone has a problem, the problem is not theirs, it's you. So he doesn't understand it. He's learned nothing. He starts posing with Macho Man. And that's where I think the seeds of discontent start. That's where they get planted, I believe. Because that's where they got planted with Andre. Now they're being planted there with Savage. But they go on together. And Hogan gets himself involved. Macho's got problems with DiBiase and Andre that go back to the main event and obviously defeating DiBiase in the finals of that tournament. What happens? Well, they assemble the mega powers, of course. Hulk Hogan says, don't worry, Macho, I got your back. You're going to be in the main event. I'll be in the main event too. Jumps in there and at SummerSlam, it's the mega powers and the mega bucks. Hogan and Savage versus DiBiase and Andre. And while yes, yes, it's amazing to see Hogan and Savage together. I mean, the mega powers barely teamed up on television and they are remembered so fondly because it was such a big deal when they did. That SummerSlam 88, there's very few tag team main events that hold the same weight as the mega powers versus the mega bucks, but that one does. However, after the mega powers and the mega bucks, Hogan is celebrating. He's kind of celebrating with Liz as if she was equally there to celebrate Macho and Hogan. And while I understand on a professional level, Liz is accompanying both of you. I mean, you have to understand that that's your friend's girl. The fact that you guys are friends doesn't make it both your girls. It's your friend's girl, you know? But whatever, it's there. It's weird that Hogan, he, this is Hogan's problem. And he acts like, what? What do you mean? He doesn't have reverence. He didn't have reverence for Andre. And now he doesn't have reverence for Savage, even though Savage is the one who's the champion. Hogan had the same opportunity. He had more of an opportunity. Savage had to go from the first round. Hogan got to skip the first round. I know it was a double DQ finish, but Savage got his ass through the tournament. Hogan couldn't get the job done. But Hogan's not showing reverence to the champion. Hogan is there as if he's an equal, if not a little better than Savage at all points. It's the same thing he did with Andre. No reverence, no respect, and that eats away at a person. We get the Survivor Series. And Hogan and Macho are the co-captains of a Survivor Series team. Now, I've already got a problem with this because the nerve of Hogan to say, oh yeah, we'll be co-captains. How about this? No, asshole. I'm the champion. I'll be the captain. You can be on the team. Macho should be the captain. He's the champion. But Hogan goes, yeah, but I'm Hogan, so we'll be co-captains. Oh, great. Thank you. And not only that, but then you watch this match, the Survivor Series 88, which by the way, they face a team with Andre as a co-captain. So now you're literally sitting there oh, this entire time, Hogan is still messing around with Andre. Which is why, by the way, this is also brilliant because the Hogan Macho, Hogan Andre stories are completely interwoven, which is why it's all one story. To make matters worse, Hogan comes out by himself. 
Macho Man is the champion. And he comes to the ring with his team. And then Hogan gets a separate entrance with his own music. What? He's not the champion. He's not the guy. He's the champion's friend. And he's the one who's getting this spotlight? I'd be pissed off if I was Macho Man too. Macho Man is wearing yellow. SummerSlam, Survivor Series, look at what the Mega Powers are wearing, okay? Macho Man didn't wear yellow trunks. He wore pink trunks. He wore orange trunks. He didn't wear yellow trunks. If anything, Hogan should have switched his trunks to orange to match Macho Man's. But no, because they're the Mega Powers, Macho switches his colors to yellow. Macho shouldn't have to acquiesce at all. As I said before, he's the champion, but no. Now Macho's got to wear yellow. Macho's got to let Hogan have his own entrance. Macho has to share his girl with Hogan. He's the champion. Why should he have to do any of this? It's ridiculous. And then, then, the way that Hogan is celebrating with Elizabeth, I mean, he's like ignoring the fact that he and Macho are a team together. He's just staring at Elizabeth, holding Elizabeth up. It's like, get your hands off Elizabeth. We've all had a friend who is your friend, but he's just as good friends with your girl as he is with you. Nobody likes that dude. Your dude friend that you start dating somebody and then your friend thinks that look oh I'm friends with both of you no if you're my friend and let's say I get into an argument with my girl you're on my side you're not sitting there going like oh I went over to her house and talked to her about it you got to ease up that was Hogan that's the worst guy how could that be a good guy how could that be a hero the guy who goes over to your girlfriend's house after you've been in a fight with her and goes, I I talked to Elizabeth and, you know, you guys got to work this out. I I think that you were a little harsh. Oh, really? Really? That's the vibe I'm saying. That exact scenario didn't happen with these characters, but that's the vibe that Hogan had here. And Macho is being portrayed as if he's this crazy guy. He's not. He's not. A Survivor Series... Hogan should be applauding the champion, showing reverence, and then letting the champion celebrate with his lady. Not like, oh, me and Liz will celebrate. Oh, you too, macho man. Yeah, this is great. This is great. We get to Saturday night's main event off coming off of Survivor Series, and Hogan ends up getting jumped by Akeem, the African Dream, and the big boss man. And Macho Man doesn't come out to help him. He says, Hogan's got this. And a lot of people will go like, yeah, that was Macho Man, you know, being spiteful, being bitter. That was was an evil thing of the Macho Man. I don't think so. I think that was Macho Man saying, this is Hogan's battle to fight. And I'm I'm not gonna take Hogan's spotlight from him. I'm not gonna take his moment from him. See, Liz goes out there and gets involved. And when they start coming after Liz, when Boss Man handcuffs Liz, that's when Macho Man comes out and puts a stop to it. He's not cold-hearted. He's not blind to what's going on. But Hogan is is accountable for himself. He can defend himself out there. I don't need to fight Hogan's battles for him. That would never occur to Hogan, though. I don't need to fight Randy's battles for him. No, Hogan will always fight Randy's battles for him. Why? Because he can win them, and then he can get a little of that spotlight for himself. That's the way it comes across. Then we get to the Royal Rumble, and Hogan accidentally eliminates Macho Man. How convenient. How many times do we have to see this? Hogan accidentally eliminated Macho Man. Go into the future. Hogan accidentally eliminated Ultimate Warrior. I'm sure Hogan didn't mean to pull Sid Justice over the top rope. He does this to his friends all the time. Because you know who Hogan's best friend is? Victory. The pay window. The title. The ovation. That's who Hogan's best friend is. We get to the the main event, which is one of the most uh, notorious. I mean, this one is probably even more famous than the double referee angle. I would say it's definitely more famous. This is the one 
where the breakup finally happens, the mega powers finally explode because it's the mega powers, Hogan and Savage versus Akeem and the big boss man. And Elizabeth at ringside ends up getting laid out, right? And Hogan is is beside himself, which by the way, again, even if your friend is a cold-hearted bastard, when you are visibly more worried about your friend's girl than your friend is, that's a problem. It's a problem for your friend and his girl, but it's also a problem for you and your friend. Trust me, trust me. And Hogan, not only is he way over-concerned with Liz, but he's so concerned that he picks her up and he walks her to the back in the middle of a match. He leaves the WWE champion, Randy Savage, in there to fend for himself. So in this title run, he has stolen the spotlight. He's called himself a co-captain. He's made Randy Savage change the colors of his tights. Now he's leaving him there to fend for himself. That's not significantly worse than Savage not running in. It's not that he it's not that Hogan didn't run in to save Savage. It's that Savage left him there. Hogan was supposed to be there. It was a tag team match player. When Hogan finally does come back and asks for the tag, by the way, of course, because we're getting towards the end of the match, so Hogan wants to be the one to get the pin. Savage smacks him across his face because he's fed up. And then he goes to the back after the match while Hogan is sitting there beside himself. I mean, he's practically praying at Elizabeth's bedside as if it has... Hogan shouldn't even be there at that point. Macho's there. Get out of here, Hogan. Macho attacks him. He's had enough. He has an emotional response. He has an emotional response. Can you fault him? He's had enough. He attacks Hogan, and he lets Hogan know. Everybody remembers, you had lust in your eyes. Everybody remembers that phrase. You had lust in your eyes. That's the quote everybody remembers. But what people don't remember is he also said, I am not the third wheel in this group. I am not the third wheel in the mega powers. That says it all. That Hogan was trying to third wheel the WWE champion. He goes, I'm number one. I'm the champion. That's my girl. She would be two. You would be our plus one or plus three. Plus two, plus one, plus two, plus one, plus one. Hogan should be the odd man out. But he's been doing nothing but make Savage feel that way. And he's not sensitive to any of it. Any of it. He acts like, Sav- whoa, what do you mean? I didn't do anything. What do you mean? And of course, it conveniently leads to the main event of WrestleMania, Hulk Hogan versus Randy Savage. And Hogan ends up taking the title back. And the story, you know, it kind of goes on and ends up petering out. You know, Zeus, Hogan goes, he films No Holds Barred. Zeus comes in. Savage and Zeus become a team. Uh, Brutus Beefcake and Hogan are a team. And it it does the thing. But WrestleMania V is really, I think, the culmination. I find WrestleMania V to be the culmination of this story. And I believe that this story, as much as I look back on it, and maybe I was biased in my telling of it, I look back on it and I do find major fault in the behaviors of Hulk Hogan. I cannot help but side somewhat with Andre and very much with Macho Man, especially because Hogan's behavior with Andre doesn't influence his behavior with Macho at all. He doesn't learn a thing. And that bothers me. That bothers me a lot. And, you know, I mean, coming off of this, it's not like Hulkamania is dead after this. You know, we get to, after the Zeus stuff, we get to WrestleMania six, and it's uh, a, a Hogan Warrior. Hogan Warrior is one of the most important WrestleMania matches of all time. Even coming off of Hogan Warrior, you know, WrestleMania seven is not the greatest moment for Hulkamania ever, but Hogan's still popular. Leading up to WrestleMania seven, you've got Hogan and Earthquake working together, which was a great storyline. And you know, it got a little wonky going into WrestleMania eight, but still, Hulkamania was running wild. I just think. That peak, peak, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not, it doesn't fall off a cliff. 
it it slowly goes down, you know, to the point that by WrestleMania eight, I think people were a little bit ready to see Hogan, you know, start to powder and more people start to spring up. And by WrestleMania nine, people were really ready. Business was on the decline and, and people were, were ready for a refresh. But, but I think, I think to me, we're building up, we're building up. Hulkamania is building and building and building up until that Piper's Pit episode where Hogan gets the trophy for being champion for three years. And the the two and a half years that follow that, headed towards WrestleMania three to WrestleMania four into WrestleMania five is peak Hulkamania, some of the, it's the best stuff that Hogan did in that initial WWE run. It's some of the best storytelling WWE's ever done. You know, people talk about the Mega Powers Collide story as this like year-long story. It really is a two and a half year long story. It the Andre story is all part of it. Because Savage comes into the fold through Andre and DiBiase. DiBiase comes in. All look at all these icons that come from that story, right? This story is what brings Savage his first WWE championship. This story is what brings us Ted DiBiase. This story is a uh, big boss man. This it's, It all comes from this beautiful two and a half to three year long story. The likes of which we'll probably never see again just because it is so amazing that it was all pulled off. But this is, this is what's truly remarkable about WWE. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Follow at NotSam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe. This has been Not Sam Wrestling. Not Sam.